Hi everyone, welcome to ADEX Pixel Virtual Expo and for this session, uh, today is none other uh, than our In Conversation with David Stride. And today we have, of course, uh, a guest all the way from the Philippines, uh, Alex Santos. Um, let me just introduce to you a little bit more about David, David or Strikey. Um, Strikey has been uh, you know, around ADEX for a really, really long time. And he's been with us since the beginning. And uh, he has a background in military, commercial, scientific, and technical diving. Um, David is actually an Australian-based um, and also a former field editor for Asian Diver magazine. David is also a recipient of several industry recognition awards and a fellow of the Explorers Club of New York. And again, um, as mentioned earlier, our guest for today is none other than Alex Santos from Philippines. Uh, Alex is a founder and also a CEO of Philippine Technical Diver, or for short, PhilTech. I an IANTD instructor, <laughs> commercial diver, and also a member of the Filipino Cave Divers. Alex introduced tech diving to the Philippines in the year 1992. Sorry, 1993, yes. And was the Philippine licensee for IENTD. For years, he has performed deep recovery of valuable objects and also victims of drowning. His experience has been called upon many times during disasters at sea. Today, Alex mainly does commercial diving. He and his teams are known to work in brutal conditions, allowing him to observe early signs of DCS and reverse it using in-water recompression. Uh, cave exploration remains his deepest and true passion. And with a background in geology, he is better able to appreciate the value of underwater caves. Here with, um, let's not wait any longer. I will hand over this session to Strike. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Alex, welcome. It's so good to see you again. Um, like yeah, albeit via cyberspace. Uh, normally, we'd catch up sort of in Singapore at, uh, oh, yeah, around this cool. time of the year. So hopefully that will happen next year. Hopefully, yes. I'm looking forward to it again. Yeah. Um, Alex, I, I spoke to you earlier. Just for the benefit of the audience, tell us where you live. Um, I live in uh, Makati. It's within part of Metro Manila. Uh, it's the uh, main city in Metro Manila. Right. Yeah. 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 And uh, now you've been diving. I read some of the early early stuff. You actually started at a very very young age, didn't oh, you? Yeah. Diving. Yeah, tell us uh, how old were you when you first started diving? Well. Um, I don't know if you would call it diving, but um, my first experience of using the diving equipment was when I was about nine or 10. Uh, my uncle, he uh, owned uh, some fishing fleets and they would have diving equipment lying around their house. And whenever we would come to visit, um, he would ask me, it would, he would let me use his, uh, his uh, equipment when what level, what, in whatever's left in those cylinders. And I would go swimming in the pool uh, in scuba. <laughs> right, that's, that's sort of mine. And that was what, sort of self-taught? Did he give you any sort of instruction at all? Or? Oh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. He told me one thing, <laughs> the only thing I was supposed to learn at the time, which is never hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> the fun rule of diving. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have to equalize in the pool. It was only much later that I realized that, you know, equalizing yeah. had to be performed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when did you actually take up, um, uh, for want of a better term, proper diving? I mean, you were doing proper uh, diving at the age of nine, but <laughs> when? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I received proper instruction uh, in 1988, uh, I, I think, or 89. And the story behind that is really quite funny because uh, I used to dive, uh, you know, I, I used to do some clandestine dives with my friends because uh, some of my friends had tanks lying around as well. And we would go play hooked from school. And so we, we got away with it uh, a few times. But in 19, 
89, I believe uh, that was the year, my girlfriend, uh, she was Swedish, who was coming to visit me, was certified. And she had the certification and, and she said that she wanted to go diving. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not certified. And she said, well, if you don't get certified, then I'm going without you. <laughs> oh, dear. What a yeah. threat. Yeah. So, you know, so that's all that it took for me to finally put myself through a proper course. <laughs> and where did, you, where did you do that? In Manila or? Um, no, uh, I did it in Batang. Well, yeah, part of the lessons were done in Manila. We would have lectures in a, in a classroom and right. uh, sessions. And then we went over to Batangas to get certified. My teacher, my instructor was uh, Gigi Santos, uh, with no relation, but she's an excellent crack instructor. In a, and uh, her, her foundation, the foundation I received was very solid. Right. So, uh, who, who was that with? Which, which particular training organization? It, Can... was with, it was with SSI at the time. Right. Yeah. At, at that time, I didn't really care which organization it was. I just yeah. needed to get certified. I didn't know uh, the likes of Paddy or Nawi. Or, you know, the agency didn't matter to me. I was <coughs> certified. Um, <laughs> when did you start technical diving? Uh, okay, technical diving. Uh, you know, we, we had a lot of, uh, we would get a lot of uh, magazines and uh, there was very little info on the internet, but the magazines would show technical diving as early as 19, the 1990s, I believe. And so without proper training, uh, we would, you know, strap together a couple of tanks and we went deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> and I'm glad that uh, we stopped at some point because uh, when I learned, when I finally learned and got certified nitrox, I realized that we were really pushing the limits. Yes, because uh, so deep, air, deep air diving was the norm in many parts of the world then, of course. Oh, it was, it was pretty big in the, the 40 Fathoms Grotto. So we knew that going deep was acceptable as long as you did it properly. But we didn't know how to do it. We just, you know, we were just winging it at the time. Yeah. The one thing we did was we calculated our gas requirements. That is one thing that we did right. Yeah. And then and finally, in 1994, I went over to Guam and I got certified with TDI and... Uh, then I became a Nitrox and Advanced Nitrox instructor. And uh, I recall you saying, actually, you set up the first Nitrox station in the Philippines under a coconut tree. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you know, this is a funny story. You know, I went over to Guam to actually pursue my course director uh, training, my instructor trainer training. And my instructor at the time said, would you like to learn Nitrox? which is, you know, something I've always wanted to learn. And, you know, without even batting an eye, I said, yes, I would love to do that. So he trained me with nitrox and then uh, put, br brought me over to instructor. So I became an instructor at the same time. It wasn't really difficult to teach as long as you knew the academics. Yeah. The one thing we failed to consider was how to blend nitrox. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we knew the, the, math, the mathematics of uh, calculating how much O2 goes into a cylinder, but the equipment, I had absolutely zero exposure to any of the blending equipment. So I come home and I was excited to teach my first course. You know, I'm like, who, like, who do I teach? And then it dawned upon me that, wait a minute, I, I can't even make nitro. Where am I going to get yes. nitro? <laughs> So, how did you, so how did you resolve the situation? With a lot of research, David, a lot of research. Um, you know, it's a good thing that in university, I paid attention to school. Physics was one of my, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a science nut, you know, right. little, you know, I'm a very science nut and I love physics and chemistry. And with careful research, um, I managed to build a, a single whip that connected to an O2 cylinder. And because nitrox at the time was being frowned upon, the only place that the resort allowed me to do it, to, to, to blend it was on a just under a coconut tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so they gave me this little spot in the middle of the uh, the resort, and I had to strap a coconut, uh, uh, an oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, you didn't want to see the image that I had in my mind then. No, <laughs> I wish I had photographs for you, but yes, what I'm you're imagining is most likely true. <laughs> It's uh, of course it's it's very difficult because nitrox is such an accepted mainstream part of diving today. It's it's very difficult for people to comprehend that enormous opposition there was to its uh, introduction when it when it first sort of came in. Yeah, absolutely, you know I I yeah. can't remember how many names that I've been called. Um, well, on top of mind, I think what won the the voting for names to be to call me would be uh, the demon himself. <laughs> it was the. Yeah, uh, I was called that many times. I think it stuck to my head because uh, I remember being called that very many times. Uh, in addition to reckless and gung ho and yeah. uh, to die, you know. Oh, it was the gas of death, wasn't it? And, oh, and and there were so many authorities sort of well-respected medical professionals coming out and really sort of lambasting it. It's, uh, yes. Yeah. But you persevered. Of it. Tell me, why did you go to Guam? What? Uh, that's where Simon used to have an operation there, didn't he? Yeah, I didn't know Simon at the time. Yeah. But I went to Guam uh, actually to pursue a couple of things. I needed to get my instructor trainer certification with NAWI, which was my right. agency at the time. And also uh, I pursued my DAN instructor rating, uh, DAN O2 provider instructor rating. Right. So, so the Nitrox uh, training was just uh, an, an add-on, you know, it's like, yeah. it was an add-on, but which actually was the highlight of my trip. Yeah. Why were you... Um... You'd already been sort of a lot of deep air diving. What were you regarding the nitrox as a like a decompression gas or uh, just offering um, possibly safer sort of shallower diving? Well, when I learned when I was certified nitrox and I started blending when I start when I could start blending my gases. Uh, yes, we would do a lot of deep air dives, um, and we would use nitrox for the. Uh, Intermediate deco, we would right. use uh, nitrox as early as uh, 30 meters, all the way up to about six. And for me, decompressing on O2 was really the only way to go. So yeah. from six onwards, that was the only gas we would use for deco. I should have asked earlier as well, because you mentioned you were a science nut. What did you actually study at university? Um, I was a geology major. Right. Uh, I really I really wanted to get into engineering at the time, but uh, yeah. the advisors at the university told me that, you know, it, it's a quota course and it gets filled quite easily. So they said that the best way for me to enter the university was to go through a less desired course, which was geology, uh, just to ensure entering into the university. And once I got into the, the university, I went on with geology and could no longer shift back to engineering because the uh, all the slots were full. Right. But the geology would have stood you in good stead later for your, your passion with cave diving anyway, wouldn't it? Or presumably, yeah. yeah. Yes, you know, I, I never thought that I'd finally get to appreciate my education in geology. Um, when I when I finished my, uh, my course, uh, I'd look at, you know what, when you go through geology, you never see land the same way again you yeah. see a mountain you see some rocks you never see them the same way as you used to before your knowledge <laughs> <laughs> we all, all, of yeah. have, all the geological factors that have gone into yeah these the structures you know but it was only until i started diving caves that i truly appreciated what i've learned yeah i'm able to, to look at the cave and see the, the myriads of processes that the earth has gone through and the, uh, the violent and evolutionary processes that earth has to go through just to, to, yeah. to create these environments. 
just um, back while you were at university, were you were diving at the same time? Um, yeah, on and off. Yeah, yeah. When I was in university, I would dive. Uh, but um, diving, I, I had some sort of a like a break from diving because at some point I was very much involved in fencing. I was part of the national fencing team, and so ah right yeah yeah so that, oh, we used to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and mind you, I did travel to Australia and I competed in Melbourne. Really? Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, it's a very, very arduous activity. That. Oh, it's it's excellent. You know, I love. Yeah. It. It's the only sport that I could imagine myself doing again. Yeah. It's a, yes, it is. It's a it's it's a fascinating one. Yeah. But um, just back to the diving. Um, mm -hmm. and, you went and trained in deep air diving with Billy Deans. Yes, yeah. So, uh, what, uh, so uh, at this stage, you were teaching sort of nitrox, and then you were still doing, obviously, the deep air diving. So, what, you went to the States? Yeah. Um, I believe it was in 1995. Uh, sorry, I can't. It was, uh, it was DEMA. It was D San Francisco. DEMA right once in San Francisco and from that DEMA I um, met up with some of the INTD guys at the booth and they pointed me to Billy Deans to get further training and um, yeah I, I did go to Billy the course that I actually did with Billy was technical it was a technical diver course right and the, uh, the certification for deep air just encompassed the, uh, it was part of the technical training. Yeah. So I got both a technical diver and deep air diver at the same time. Because he he really is the sort of the. I guess I'm not out of line here saying he's he really is the grandfather of technical diving, wasn't he? Billy Deans was uh, the the man to go to. Oh yes, oh yes. Um, everything that I do. Uh, in terms of technical diving, the way I teach, the way I dive, yeah. I owe to Billy Deans. He was a huge inspiration to to how I do my courses and how I conduct myself yeah. uh, whenever I dive. Yeah. Where did you do those in Florida? Or yeah, at his uh, at his uh, place in Key West, Key West Divers. Yeah. But I believe you know what I believe. Um, Michael may not know, may, may not remember this, but I met Michael Menduno. Right, he was divers when I was training with Billy. Ah, yes, because he was uh, sort of involved there and uh, deeply interested. Oh, Aquacore would have been running, of course, at that stage. Mm. Was it still going, Aquacore? Sorry, Aquacore magazine would have still been oh, active very, then. Very active yeah, then. yeah. Um, I didn't miss a, I didn't miss a copy. I have all the copies of Aquacore still. In <laughs> <laughs> I've thrown away all the other magazines, but I kept Aquacore. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, going to be collector's items. Oh, yeah, um, and then, so was it the same year? You also trained then with Tom Mount as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, when I started uh, diving caves, uh, it was Tom Mount that took over my training because Tom was uh, mainly based in, uh, in Miami. Right. From Miami, we would travel all the way to the to Cape Country. So it was Tom. It, well, there were several instructors uh, that taught. It was a team uh, that taught taught us. There was Tom Mount. There was Larry Green. Uh, there were the Orlowski uh, couple. Uh, yeah, I went through a whole lot of uh, different instructors when I learned Cape oh. diving. It was really good. Because you, you learn so many different things from each individual. Yeah. Had you done cave diving in the Philippines before you went over there? Or had oh, you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. ah. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say that that was the reason I wanted to get certified. <laughs> because... to, to learn how to do it properly. Or, I got myself into a little pickle. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, can you talk about it? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's this uh, cave in, in Anilao, 
that uh, with the entrance of which is at 45 meters. And, you know, we would frequent that cave. Uh, it was one of those regular dives that we did as sport divers. But my inquisitive nature led me to look around, you know, people would always go to the cave in and out, in and out, but not me, you know, I'd like, I like poking my head into little things. And I found this hole, this just very little hole on the ground, on the bottom of the cave floor. So I stuck my head into it and I saw that it snaked further down into some place. So I tried to get my buddy wedged in halfway, not knowing that one of my uh, friends had gotten down beside me and was kicking up all this silk. So when it was time for me to back out, I just looked back and I couldn't see a darn thing. And my, my head was still above that ceiling. You know, you know, I couldn't get up. I didn't know how to get out of it. So I just gradually pushed my way and backed out of the, 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 the hole until my head was above the silt cloud. But then my friend was still in the silt cloud and I could see bubbles rising just above the silt. So as soon as I saw his bubbles, I just grabbed him from, grabbed him on whatever I could get a hold of. I believe it was his head that I grabbed and I pulled him out of there. And, and at that point, at that very moment, I said to myself, I gotta get a cake home. <laughs> 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 so I think a lot of people would probably have said well that's it I've done cave diving I'll now go and do something else in the open ocean away from caves but uh, wow so that's what prompts you to get that the the cave diving and, and doing it with Tom Mount who uh, yeah. certainly one of the premier people and, and that was with INTD then yes it was with INTD yeah. Was that your first exposure to IANTD? Or? Well, my first exposure, again, was with Billy. Oh, right, uh, right. Yeah. And I think it was in the following year that I got, uh, well, no, no, it was in the same year. I, I had returned to Florida in, I think, September or October of the same year. Right. And that's when I uh, did my CAID course with Tom and, uh, and his uh, uh, group of instructors. Yeah. Boy. And, and what, what sort of caves did you dive uh, in Florida? In Florida, yeah. Oh, I, I can remember a few, but definitely there is uh, Devil's Ear and Devil's Eye. Right. Um, there's Little River, which is one of my favorites. Uh, we went to Madison, uh, Madison Blue, I think is what it was called. Right. And there were like a couple more other caves that uh, we, we trained in. But yeah, for the most part, we did quite a few. Uh, dives at uh, Devil's Ear. Yeah. And so, obviously, back in the Philippines, then you were felt better qualified to um, conduct cave diving. Yeah. And uh, when I when I finally got trained, first thing I did was go back to that cave, <laughs> that place <laughs> I did a cave that we talked about earlier. But this time I was accompanied by a good friend, also a certified cave diver. He trained in Florida as well. His name is uh, MG, MG Ebro. Right. So the two of us had gone into this cave and actually went down. It's the, the tunnel snaked down all the way to 60 meters and it opened up into this huge chamber. And, you know, when, when once we got to the chamber, we were like, you know, our regs almost dropped out of our mouth and we were just like, oh. It was, it was huge. It was beautiful. It, it wasn't decorated because this is a sea cave. So there are no decorations yeah. at all. But, you know, at, uh, the, the cave goes down to 60 meters. And uh, I guess with the uh, addition of a little bit of narcosis, everything just looked so awesome. <laughs> and no one had been there prior to it. So it, it was Virgin Cave. Yes, it was. It was. Uh, well, I can't imagine if... I can't imagine anyone having been there yeah. before us. It may be possible that someone had been there before, but I seriously doubt it. So I believe we were the first ones to enter. Yeah. And there yeah. was another fellow that came with us. His name is Al Filart. Yeah. So I think there were the, there was the three of us. Yeah. Oh, wow. oh yeah. And there was one other guy. Uh, Nico Hilario was with us as well. 
Yeah, so Biko took some photographs of the cave. Right. And what sort of cave? So presumably there's caves all the way through the, the Philippines. So did that sort of spark then your interest in exploring a lot of them and discovering them? Or? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because uh, once I got the taste for cave diving, you know, it was all I could think about. And the next thing for us was to explore other areas of the Philippines, which we were certain had uh, caves. Yeah. Uh, our first destination was in the northern mountains of the Philippines, in Cagayan. Again, it was with me, MG, uh, Miko, uh, and Al, and a few other guys who came to help out. And we, we actually found some caves up in the mountains. Uh, but th these caves weren't uh, very long, you know, they, they didn't go ways of a distance, but yeah. were, were just fascinating as well. I mean, just looking at the structure, you realize, you know, wow, look at the way this cave was formed. Yeah. So they were really beautiful. And what, um, because you then went on, you've, you become sort of an instructor trainer, an instructor certifier, and you, you went back to... Florida several times. You took over then the uh, IANTD in the Philippines. Uh, yeah, um, I was uh, I was given instructor trainer status, and I was offered the licensee for for license for to run IANTD in the Philippines. So it was then that we became prolific with the with the spreading technical diving in the Philippines. Yeah. It was when I actually got the uh, licensee. Oh, sorry, the license for INTD. And, you know, um, talking about that, when, when I started teaching nitrox and technical, I, I realized that people could only dive if they were diving with me. And that seemed to me very prohibitive because when you teach someone, you want them to be able to take advantage. You want them yeah. to be able to go around and, and dive other places. Yeah. And that was when I realized that I had to go on a mission I had to embark on a mission to spread technical diving all over the Philippines. So I, uh, one of my first few stops were uh, Asia divers in uh, Puerto Galera. Uh, I spoke to Alan Nash and, you know, yeah. he was really keen on and starting uh, technical diving at Asia divers. And then there was also Calypso uh, in Boracay. Uh, these were the first guys who embraced the uh, technical diving in the Philippines. And when they got set up, the dive shops had eyes looking into what we were doing and everyone was really keen on, on finding out what are these guys up to? So they, everyone was really looking intently and it wasn't long after that all the other dive shops wanted to get technically trained as well. Yeah. And you were still, fairly obviously, this was still uh, largely compressed air. Oh, no, uh, it was using nitrox. and and nitrox. Yeah, yeah. I had to help them build nitrox uh, stations. Uh, yeah, we had to give them the equipment, the hardware to be able to do so, and the training. Yeah. So, well, once they had their nitrox uh, station running with with oxygen as well and with helium, then they all got set up to do all the way technical diving up to trimix. So moving on to the to the helium, you went back to the States to, to learn and do trimix again with Billy? Yes, again with Billy. Yeah. Yeah. So I was really happy about that because, you know, there was nobody else I wanted to train with uh, other than Billy. And yes, yes, uh, checklists. The one thing I learned from Billy that is so in place up to this day are checklists. Yeah, you know, uh, Billy is just top notch. I yeah. Say. So moving back, so back in the Philippines, then now you could teach trimix. So did you have problems getting getting gas, getting helium? Or? Uh, no problems uh, sourcing out the helium. The only problem really was price. Yeah. Yeah, helium doesn't come cheap in the Philippines, so. Um, it wasn't long after that I switched over to rebreathers just to be able to save on on helium. Yeah. You know, the, the last thing you want to do is just, you know, exhale all that excess helium into the atmosphere. Yeah. And when did you, so how did you get into commercial diving? Because that's your other sort of activity, your major activity, isn't it? 
Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I'm, the the beginnings were kind of fuzzy because I know that someone had mentioned my name because there was a client who was looking to to have pile restoration work done in a pier. So my name was offered up as a person to as a go to person, and uh, yeah, we spoke. And initially, what he needed were photographs of the the pier or the conditions of the piles. And David, I kid you not, I had absolutely zero experience in taking photographs. <laughs> so I ran into this dive shop and got myself one of these uh, the Icolite cameras where you, you stick a cartridge yeah. in. I figured that would be the least fuzzy and the easiest to operate. And I got myself a little flash. And so I took on, I took on the job. I, uh, <laughs> aiming with confidence, of course. Uh, so there would be no doubt as to whether I could do it. And I took photos and they turned out pretty well. Uh, once the photographs came, the next thing that was asked of me is, can you rebuild these piles because at the splash zone there was there was a lot of uh, erosion uh, right. water began eating into the piles and you know, <clears throat> the uh, what do you call these these worms the uh, the borers the concrete borers yeah. into it so we ended up uh, doing the next phase of it which was pile restoration and that's how I got my I got my foot in the door with commercial dining really yep and from then on it was just word of mouth yeah. Uh, when somebody needed something else, you know, my name was uh, brought up again and I would get a call. So what were you doing? You were operating uh, as a single single operator or had you started a little business at all? Uh, at the beginning, it was uh, just myself and I would go ahead and hire these uh, these uh, hookah divers, you know, these yeah. guys that, that, uh, breathe with these uh, hoses in their mouths to help me out with the job. Because if you hire a diver, a certified diver, then um, they come very expensive. And the only way to, to get the contract is to keep the prices low so that the contract becomes uh, acceptable to the client. Yeah. So I would hire these divers who would fin, fit around with wooden fins and, and, uh, and uh, wooden goggles with, with glass. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was <laughs> at the time. it was acceptable at the time, but if I, if I tried to if I tried to get a con contract these days and offer up these sort of services, I would be turned out of the door. You know, they <laughs> sent me off. Yes, you should have. Oh, what marvelous equipment to hang on to as museum pieces, though. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wish I had uh, asked for souvenirs of fans yeah. and goggles, but. Mainly, it was uh, I supervising the, the the work, and you know these guys are excellent to work with because they're so courageous and they just don't say no. They don't say no to whatever you give them. They just work and work and work without yeah. any complaints whatsoever. And what so what sort of year was what sort of year was this that you started the commercial work? I remember this was before I even got technically trained. Oh right. Yeah, because uh, the reason I I thought about it is because we were just diving with single tanks at the time and yeah. uh, without the benefit of nitrox. So I know for a fact that uh, this was before I got trained in technical. Right. And uh, you had some, uh, uh, I, I guess, sort of horrid experiences in terms of sort of body retrieval, um, I think, around about that sort of period. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, you know, um, thinking about it, thinking back, it's uh, I, I don't know how I got started with body recovery. Again, I, and I think it was because of my notoriety for diving deep. Yeah. People thought that I'd be the best go to guy for these sort mm. of things. And uh, a dive shop, the dive shop that I uh, used to work with a lot, Aqua Venture at the time. I remember that uh, there was a lady there called Lydia who uh, put me in touch with someone who had just lost a friend. And uh, so immediately we were put together and I spoke to her and she told me that uh, they, were, they were swimming 
uh, in the lake. Uh, it was uh, the northern part of the Philippines, and uh, her friend never surfaced. And they said, you know, she's probably uh, at the very bottom of the lake, which is deep. And you know, because because it was rather an emergency, you know, they wanted to get retrieve the body right away. Um, without even thinking twice, I said, okay, let's go. I couldn't get myself to find someone to come with me. So I agreed to go and uh, do it on my own. So we got to, we cut to the area and immediately when I arrived at the area, I could, I could smell a bit of uh, that foul smell, uh, the smell of decay, but you wouldn't see, you couldn't see anyone at the surface of the water. So whatever it was, I just went ahead and did my dive. And I bottomed out at say about 20, 25 meters or so, and uh, couldn't find her. Couldn't find. Looked around, just swam around. I couldn't find her. And as I was coming up, there I see a body which is just trapped underneath a, a life raft, no, a, a bamboo raft. Her body had floated and uh, uh, stuck underneath the bamboo raft. Yeah. Which explained why we could smell uh, that uh, that decay and yeah. Uh, Pulled her out and we wrapped her in a body bag. Yeah, that was my first experience actually in body recovery. And it was uh, that time where I learned not to look into a person's eyes, uh, a victim's eyes, because they, the, the image lingers with you for, for days and days. Yeah. Which was a mistake I made actually. It's, uh, I, I guess there would be the. The, the fact that you're bringing closure to the yes yes I, to I knew survivors I, right yeah yeah I knew when I was uh, headed over there that uh, there was no chance that she had survived yeah it was really a day uh, but it was you know just uh, being able to bring closure is uh, the reason for that it drives yeah. you to, to help them yeah so um, you when did you start Philtech? Um, I believe Philtech uh, in 1994, it's about the same time, uh, when I got trained with uh, Nitrox is when I decided right. Philtech. I, I believe I even started planning out Philtech in 1993 because I was looking back at my records and the Philtech logo, the one that you see, was actually developed by a good friend of mine, Dexter. And he developed that logo in 1993. Wow. Yeah. So I know that uh, Philtech was conceived around about that time. Yeah. But I believe in 1994 was when we made it official. Right. And that's still operating today? Yes. Yes, very much so. Uh, we used to teach a lot of courses and sell equipment, but our main source of income now would be commercial diving. Right. Oh. Yeah, so and um, so also you went and you went back to the states again to to train with Tom Mountain. Yeah, um, uh, you did a lot of journeys back to the states. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that was uh, about the same time that I met Simon actually. Right, Simon and I were uh, classmates in our cave instructor course. Ah. Yeah. And yes, of course, Simon had set up uh, IANTD in uh, Micronesia. Micronesia, yeah. 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 So, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I tell you, when you get trained up as an instructor for CAVE, the uh, mistakes are unforgivable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when Wait, you did you ever meet Bob Kaysen at all? Or Yes, yes, I met Bob. Um, Bob was actually in charge of the Philippines uh, when I met him. Right. And uh, I don't know what uh, what sort of uh, the discussion had went on with the headquarters and Bob, but they eventually awarded me the license for INTD, and I believe Bob wasn't really very happy about that. Oh. But I did meet him, and he's an yeah. excellent guy. Yeah. Uh, he used to be my assistant. Hmm. Yeah, God. Yeah. And um, the bit that really fascinates me 
about all of this. You developed your own procedures for in-water recompression as well. This yeah. was as a result of what, the, the commercial diving or the technical diving or the combination of both? Uh, it was mainly because of commercial diving. Right. Um, the reason I developed the, uh, the procedures for it was there was a project that I was involved in and it was uh, the project required me to go down to 124 meters to recover copper plates. And unfortunately, I was the only Trimix diver at the time. I was the only one trained up, so there was no one I could bring with me. Um, so I went on it all on my own. Now, I was afraid at some point because I was diving <laughs> once a day, uh, three days on, three days off in a week, uh, every dive to 124 meters. And I was afraid of getting bent. I was really afraid of getting bent. So yeah. uh, what, the, uh, what the, the, the oxygen or the decompression station uh, entailed me hanging a huge oxygen cylinder uh, all the way to six meters. So it served as my uh, decompression station because I went through many, many hours of deco. Um, and then I realized that having this, this decompression station at six, it doesn't require much more to just bring it back, to, to lower it down to nine meters in case I got bent. And uh, in one of the dives, I think I may have been paranoid, but I just felt a little bit of pain on my shoulder. I'm not, again, I'm not sure if I got bent or, or not, but the pain alone is, uh, you know, it's suspicious enough for you to yeah. want to get pressed. And uh, lucky for me, uh, my friends and I had purchased uh, some full face masks at the time. And so I had them, I had them with me. So the, what I did, you know, within 30 minutes of feeling that pain, I switched over to a full face mask and we lowered the cylinder down to nine meters and I started doing uh, in water recompression. Um, now, mind you at the time, I didn't have any set tables for, for doing this. It was all uh, being done, you know, just like uh, uh, as we went, as we go. So I, yeah. yeah I All I did was I spent about half an hour at nine meters and then slowly met, met, brought myself up. And by the time I reached the surface, well, the pain was gone. So you thought, here's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. But I always believed in in-water recompression. Way back then, I always thought that it was of sound fundamental uh, science. Yeah. yeah, it was actually sort of frowned upon, wasn't it, uh, in yeah. in some medical circles? And yet the the pearl divers in Broome had been using it for for quite some while, quite successfully. Yeah. Um, so, what did you do? Have you developed your own sort of uh, tables for, uh, for use? Yes, we actually have tables for uh, yeah. for different. Uh, symptoms for different severities. Um, uh, I think the, the most important thing about in-water recompression is the speed at which you can bring a diver back in the water, um, which, which if you can bring a diver back in the water within an hour or maybe even half an hour, then you don't need to spend so much time in the water recompressing because it, you, you're able to reverse the symptoms quite rapidly as opposed to sitting on the surface and waiting for for uh, evacuation to a chamber, because while you're sitting there, your symptoms are getting far worse than you can imagine, yeah. and without without knowing how far they would go. And by the time you hit the chamber, then the damage has already progressed to a point where you need several treatments inside the chamber. So the beauty of recompression in water recompression is you can do it in a very short span of time from the onset of symptoms. And it makes it so much more easy to, to reverse the symptoms. And we've done it with 100% success. Yeah. What about um, uh, surface treatment facilities uh, around uh, Manila, for example, or throughout the, the Philippines? Uh, hyperbaric facilities, are there, are there many? Yeah, there are quite a few. Uh, yeah. Even now, these days, uh, we have many. Uh, what well, we used to have just a few chambers, uh, one in Cebu and one in Manila, or, or sorry, two in Manila uh, right. a few years back. 
but uh, now there are more chambers, more more strategically located. Yeah. There's chamber uh, close to uh, almost every major dive destination. Yeah. And uh, oh, time is really sort of galloping away, and we haven't really? haven't even s- scratched the surface of uh, the thing here. Um, some of the some of the tasks that you've been called upon to perform are, are tasks that uh, not everyone would willingly sort of accept and you've done a lot of body recovery so i think the, the most notable was uh, the, the ferry tell the tell the story of that if you would please alex yeah um the uh, the big ferry disaster uh that one called the uh, um, mv saint thomas aquinas yeah she, she carried about 800 uh, passengers and uh, she collided with uh, another uh with, with a cargo vessel it didn't take very long for her to go down. And because of my previous engagement with the Coast Guard, um, I was an easy phone call because I knew the guys very well by this time. And I had developed a, an excellent rapport with them. And in fact, I had already trained some, some Coast Guard divers in technical diving. So right. we, had a, we already had a team in place to, to do the recoveries. So uh, it took us about a day or so to get to the site. And uh, as soon as we arrived there, uh, I always know for for a fact that when you begin your recovery, you have to start on the outsides and the periphery of the wreck because there you will find a lot of uh, victims because yeah. a lot of them are trying to to make it out of the wreck or or the ship, and so they tend to pull around these uh, these uh, uh, what do you call them the, these bottlenecks because the doors are very narrow, so they're trying to scamper and they get trapped into this bottleneck. And that's where you find most of them. Mm-hmm. So we went, we, we started going around the wreck and we plucked uh, several people uh, out of the, the Aquinas on the first day alone. Mm-hmm. It was a joint effort, by the way, with the uh, Philippine Navy who worked uh, very, very well uh, alongside us. So we, we had a very good relationship with them working with uh, recovery. We also had some... Uh, some uh, technically trained uh, divers from the Special Action Force of the Philippine Police. What sort of depth was the ferry? Uh, the uh, deepest part of the ferry was at 50 meters. Right. And the shallowest portion would be, say, about uh, maybe 30, 35 meters. Yeah. So it was, it was uh, tilted. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we we found we found uh, bodies as deep as fifty meters. Yeah, mm. and the the more bodies you re- remove, the harder it is to find the others because you know you you find the ones that are very obvious. So yeah, you know, you them up to the surface, and then when you can't find uh, the other ones because you, we've got a tally and we know that some people are still missing, that's when you have to go through the debris. You have to start you know, pulling, pulling up the debris, uh, looking, looking underneath to see if they've been uh, uh, covered up or, or, you know, beneath the debris. Some of them actually are on the ceiling with debris uh, covering them up. Mm. Yeah. How many bodies did you have to recover from that? I can't remember, uh, but uh, the combined efforts, I believe, uh, we recovered, I think, anywhere from 70 to 80 uh, victims. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that was the biggest uh, operation yeah. I was involved in. Yeah. But, uh, you, know, um, you, you mentioned as well, um, you had trained uh, some of the Coast Guard people. You also trained overseas, didn't you? You trained some overseas units. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I... I I can't remember which year it was, but the Malaysian Fire Department, they had sent a, a contingent of, uh, of divers to get trained in uh, technical and wreck diving. Right. To, to train them up to be able to respond to inland emergencies because in most developed countries, inland emergencies such as uh, cars falling into ravines and, and, and waters, th- this is the uh, purview of the fire department. And so they sent me a, a couple of contingents, actually, yeah. uh, 16 uh, 
persons each. <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> so I had to I had to get uh, as many assistants as I could, um, and uh, yeah, we trained them up, and uh, that's pretty good. Uh, very happy with the results. What were you and you were teaching them um, open circuit? This would have been presumably, or were you also? You mentioned earlier about using a rebreather and switching to rebreathers. Were you doing a lot of rebreather diving at this stage? Um, yeah, you know, actually, there was a time when uh, I dove almost exclusively up rebreathers, right. but this was uh, uh, semi-closed rebreathers. Yeah, so I had gone through. Uh, the, the dolphin, the uh, the other version of the dolphin, the a uh, lot simpler one. I think it was the ray. It was called the, the ray. ray. Yes, it looked like a squash cat. Yeah, <laughs> uh, very very limiting, but uh, it was all right. Uh, yeah. The, the draggers were very simple to use and uh, probably not best configured, but they were you know the easy to use. I would say. Um, then uh, I I was able to dive the uh there was a version of the frog it was semi-closed but it was mechanically uh sorry it was you can switch from semi-closed to fully closed right. by simply adjusting the dosage so it was mechanically um closed circuit and my first uh and my second mechanically closed circuit rebreather was the uh submatix from germany Right. I, I fell in love with that unit. It's a very good unit, yeah. but I hardly use it anymore. It's gathering a lot of dust. What are you using now? Um, well, I'm not using any rebreather at the moment. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, lockdown. But, uh, yeah, I would love to. I'd love to get uh, yeah. trained rebreathers because the technology has changed since then. So I'm really keen on getting my own new rebreather. Yeah. Uh, but I need to find someone who's willing to make the same investment. <laughs> and uh, back to other recovery jobs that you've been involved with. There was um, a, an aircraft incident as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Department of Interior and local, local government, the secretary then at the time, uh, figured in a plane crash. And uh, the Coast Guard... Uh, called me immediately to ask for my assistance. Now, the sad part about that uh, incident was I was actually packing my bags to go to Singapore with my daughter. And, and the, the call came in because I saw it on the news that uh, the secretary had figured in a plane crash. And I was like, oh, dear, I think I'm going to be called uh, soon enough. And as we were packing, true enough, the phone call came. And so they were asking for my assistance. And the thing is, I asked them if they knew where the aircraft was. They said they didn't know where it was as of that time. So I, says, I said to them, you know, the first thing you need to do is locate the aircraft. Because it makes no sense for me to go and dive just to look, to search for the aircraft. You have to use um, uh, sonars. You have to yeah. use point scans. And, uh, or multi-beam sonars and locate the, wreck, the wreckage before you send any divers down below. So I told them, you know, as soon as you locate the aircraft, I'll be on the first flight back to the Philippines and I will assist in the recovery. But uh, as it turned out, the people, uh, the government officials and the, uh, you know, the other agencies had panicked because I wasn't around to do the job. So they sent out this, this, there's a post, I believe, on social media asking for technical divers to help out. So there was, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, yeah. everybody from, from wherever, they just turned up and they, they were willing to help. So one of the hardest things to do is vet the divers, you know, just to make sure that they're actually qualified to do it. Yeah. So I was in Singapore and on the day that I was about to return, they had actually been able to locate and recover the, the secretary. But right. the funny thing about that, because they were so focused on recovering the secretary that as soon as he was uh, brought to the surface, he was uh, flown to, to Manila, I believe. And the entire entourage of people and press and everybody just left the scene and they forgot that 
the, the right engine that had failed, the one that caused the, uh, the crash, was left underneath the, the, the ocean. So they forgot to recover it. <laughs> so did, they, did you actually sort of recover it in the end? Or? Yes, yes, it was my team that recovered the engine. Yeah. Yeah. So that's as far as my involvement was. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be involved in recovering the secretary, but um, the last thing you want to do is, I mean, <coughs> look to you years from now and say, yeah, come with me. You know, so I, I guess we're covering the, the engine, though, the parts, because this is what ultimately the uh, uh, safety officials need to know what went wrong. Correct. It was yeah. uh, crucial to the investigation on what caused the, the crash or the failure. Yeah. Wow. Mate. Um, and then you've got a second multiple casualty recovery inside a shipwreck. Uh, well, that was the first one, actually. Uh, there was a shipwreck called, called the Catalin B. Um, right. it, it ended up at uh, 74, 75 meters of water. Right. And uh, the Coast Guard uh, had actually been trying to recover the, the victims uh, because it, the, the accident occurred in, December, occurred in December 24th, I believe. And... Uh, they had been at it for a month and couldn't get to recover. They were able to recover a few uh, bodies from outside the wreck, but there were many more trapped inside. So it came to a point where they needed help. And that's when they turned to Filtech. Um, they asked us to help, uh, help them out recover the ones that were left inside. So it was in February that, you know, it's, well, a couple of months after the, the sinking that we had actually gone to the site and recovered the uh, remaining victims. On the first dive to the 75 meters, we were able to retrieve eight bodies. Ooh. Yeah. And then God. we did a dive on that <clears throat> another six. Yeah, so you're the, uh, the go-to person when there's those sort of incidents. Well, uh, at the time, yes, but yeah. it always saddened me to think that uh, they would have to resort to civilians to be able to do their jobs, which is why uh, the Coast Guard and myself, we, we made an agreement to, to train them. I wanted to, them to take the lead because they, they should be the lead agency doing yeah. this. And it, it, you know, as much as I would love to help them, it doesn't look very good uh, media-wise that you have to depend on a civilian to do the work that they should be qualified to do. Yeah. We did train several of these guys. I mean, these are excellent gentlemen. You know, they, they, they're very skilled. They're, they're very courageous and they're so easy to train up. And I love, truly love working with them. And they've got the Coast Guard is now several uh, technical divers that are trained in body recovery. Yeah. So I'm wow. really happy. Yeah. Really we're getting uh, very, very close to the end of the session. So what I'm going to do, there's a couple of adverts here. Hmm. One, for people that would like to learn more <laughs> about Alex, yeah. um, you have a, a, a wonderful story in Strauss's book, Close Calls. So mm -hmm. um, I do recommend that for, for people. And the other wonderful story is oh. contained in the Dining with Divers, Volume 2, by so, or compiled by Simon Pridmore and David Strait. Um, and that is an absolutely wonderful tale about uh, the evils of seafood. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know... Uh, as I was, I was, as I was going through that moment, I was like a monkey holding on to a banana. Look, Nora has very kindly allowed us a little bit of, of extra time. Do you want to tell that this goes back a little bit to the days of when you were a spear fisherman? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was a time when spear fishing was still accepted as one of the uh, activities to do. And we always had this group of uh, people who would come from the States who 
whose uh, menu required sushi to be on board fresh every day. So the uh, the job, I was it was incumbent upon me to provide sushi every single day. Now we had been on a trip on that particular trip. We had been on the, the liveaboard for like maybe three or four days without a single side of a of a tuna. Uh, we had we had uh, we had made ourselves happy with uh, maybe uh, a surgeon fish here and there, but people were getting tired of the surgeon fish, the occasional surgeon fish. So it was down to I think the last day of the trip, where there was so much the, the pressure was insurmountable to bag a tuna, a real tuna for sashimi that day. And so we were diving off of Bastera and, you know, prayers were answered. You know, there was a group of tuna that was uh, coming my way. There, there, was, uh, there were a few uh, small tunas. And then there was this, this uh, grandfather of all tunas that was just right behind them. He was a huge, he was a, he was a huge monster, you know, probably about maybe 60 to 80 kilos worth of tuna. And, you know, I just held my breath and didn't look at him so as not to, to, to give away my intentions. And he just came right at me. You know, he was just so curious to see what, what I was doing. So he came right at me and I, I literally could extend the gun and, and touch him with the spear. And so all I had to do was pull the trigger and, you know, he was knocked out. He was dead cold when, when I hit him. And the people beside me were cheering. They were going, woo, 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 woo. we're going to have tuna. We're going to have tuna. So I was pulling the tuna in. And, you know, in just a few seconds, he started whipping its tail. It whipped its tail and started heading down to the depths of Bastera. I had a reel on my spear gun. So I said, you know, go ahead and, you know, swim. Swim uh, to your heart's delight. And then that reel had unspooled in less than a minute. It went wee pam. And then it started dragging me down. Of course, I didn't want to let go of my spear gun and of the tuna, so I held on to it tight and began inflating my BC to no avail. It was pulling me down really quick. So uh, I started equalizing a bit, and I saw my friend Frank, uh, so Hank, Hank Tony Maker. He was right above me, and I said, hey, help me out, help me out. So he grabbed my other hand, and we were both feeling like crazy, trying to prevent this tuna from dragging us both down. But because I had two hands occupied, I couldn't equalize my ears. So my ears were getting busted <laughs> as being dragged down. <laughs> you know, I was like, ow, ow, ow. But again, you know. Greed got the better of you. You weren't prepared to let go. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So uh, it, was, it was lucky that uh, there were a few sharks hovering about and they started chomping on the tuna. Of course, I was oblivious to this because I, I was worried about my safety, but yeah. everybody else in the group had witnessed about seven or eight sharks take its turn chomping off on this tuna until nothing was left. <laughs> so you owe your well-being to a pack of sharks. Yeah, so I told them, yeah. I think we should be lucky to have certain fish for sashimi. Yes, I can remember as well in the story you were saying, chicken, I will eat chicken, I will eat chicken. Alex, look, thank you so much. We, we ran a little bit over time. Nora, um, <laughs> Nora, thank you for allowing us that uh, little bit of extra leeway. Alex, once again, it's been absolutely superb to catch up with you. And I do look forward to the next time we're able to do it live. So thank you once again. And let me hand back to, to Nora. Thank you so much, Reiki. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I'm really excited. I mean, like, I don't know. I, I was engaged all throughout from stories of um, victims to tuna. So, um, yeah, the tuna bit was funny. So, uh, yeah, so thank you once again for your time and um, for sharing with the ADEX community uh, your stories and your expertise. And um, we look forward to seeing like both of you more uh, in person, most probably in the next uh, ADEX, hopefully next year, if nothing 
goes wrong with the global pandemic, of course. Fingers crossed. Um, so uh, aside from that, uh, to all the com uh, to everybody's watching, uh, please do join us this coming Saturday uh, for one of our sessions where we will be um, introducing some of the ADEX um, ocean artists, and they will be showcasing their artwork, and also you'll be able to purchase them if you are interested. So uh, once again, thank you both, Strikey and also Alex. Um, Strikey, over to you if you have any other last words. No, thank you, Nora. Um, I think in two weeks' time, we're um, chatting to Mark Powell. So that's the, the next one. But Alex, thanks once again. Nora, thank you. Okay. And uh, look forward to speaking to you both again soon. So thank you. Yep. See thank you soon. Good night, everyone. Uh, good night. Thanks, Alex.